Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Second Act Actors. I'm your host, Dr. Janet McMorty, and I'm still a medical doctor simultaneously trying to pursue a career in acting. My guest this week is Dr. Jim Jenkinson. Dr. Jim. Jim is a dentist turned actor. My first ever dentist turned actor, and he has an incredible story to tell. His partner is KK, Kristen Keller, she and I perform in an improv troupe together, and that's how I got introduced to Jim and heard his wonderful story. You may recognize Jim, and we talk about this in the episode, if you ever fly on Air Canada, because he is in the in-flight safety video. I didn't even know this was a thing that we actors could do. Oh my gosh. I tell, whenever I'm on a plane, on an Air Canada plane, I tell everyone around me who will listen when we're watching the Implied Safety video. I'm like, that, I know him. I know that guy. See the, the Nova Scotia lobster fisherman? I know that guy. I know that guy. <laughs> he has a fantastic story to tell. Please enjoy the hilarious Dr. Jim Jenkinson. <laughs> going to school we were all on a fast track to uh, all the professional schools like medicine dentistry law and things like that and so as I was traveling through high school I was taking all the sciences and you know a few English and history just in case um, but I didn't take drama or anything like that I was involved in a couple of the school plays just tangentially not you know a major part but um, when I graduated from university the first time round, I, uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so I took two years off. And during those two years, uh, I was working, at, but I found a course that was being offered by a lady named Karen Hazard. And Karen was a very uh, well-known casting agent back in the 70s. Um, she just passed away about five years ago. Um, lovely lady. But her course, uh, when you went in there, they told you that you would be given two... Uh, film projects at the end of it. It could be a commercial and a film, or it could be two films, whatever. And I thought, well, that's a lot better than most courses where they say, okay, you're on your own. Um, good luck. You know, chances are one in a million, you'll get something. And that sounds like good odds to me. So I, uh, I took it and a uh, really diverse group of people. I ended up in a um, background sort of uh, position, like an extra on uh, The Silent Partner, which was an Elliot Gould movie back in the 77, 78, somewhere around there. And then I also did an Ultrabite toothpaste commercial, which uh, obviously wasn't a big seller for Ultrabite because that's a brand that's gone now, but it was kind of prophetic about going into dentistry that I did that. But the one thing that I, I actually got three parts then, I guess, to think about it. she uh, she got me into a made-for-TV movie that was being filmed in Toronto, Richard Romer's Separation. It was about the Quebec-Canada uh, separation going a lot of that discussion back in the late 70s. Of course, the referendum was in 80. But uh, anyway, in this movie, uh, we had people like uh, Barry Morse uh, from The Fugitive and things like that. He was there as the Canadian Prime Minister and uh, so on. But uh, I got the job of the doorman at the Grand Hotel in Paris. And this was uh, subbed in, Casaloma subbed in for the Grand Hotel in Paris. Uh, and uh, all the cars had European license plates on them and so on. So. I'm in this doorman's outfit, I think mainly because I was the guy who fit it. The hat didn't fit me, but they just left me bareheaded and said, you're the doorman. So I uh, I was receiving people, and one of the people who uh, I opened the door for was Alexandra Stewart, a well-known European actress at the time. She was in Praise of Older Women and things like that. Uh, she didn't have much use for me trying to be a, a, a doorman there. She kind of took my hand on the way out of the car, and then I think she practically spit on me on her way in the car, into the hotel. But uh, that was my uh, brush with fame, shall we say. And uh, I was on screen for all of 13 seconds, uh, a couple of which I played a, a bodyguard in the uh, in the casino for Arab sheikhs. So they were looking for guys who had dark hair and mustaches to play bodyguards. And so that's what I got. Um, modern cinema folks, you would never get a job like that unless you were Middle Eastern. But uh, back then, dark hair was enough. So, yeah, so that was that was my introduction. Obviously, it wasn't a big thing. I think I made $100 for the t whole time I was there. 
Um, so it didn't influence me. I, I ended up uh, going to uh, the dental school after all. I, I'd, I'd sat in on some classes in the law school with a friend of mine. I'd sort of put aside my ideas of medicine because I didn't want to be in a place where somebody died on my shift and things like that. That's what you think about when you're 18 or 19, you know. Um, so I, I did my dental school uh, program, went out, uh, graduated, uh, ended up in Muskoka, uh, practiced there for 25 years, did orthodontics and lots of uh, sort of alternate dentistry. We were not, um, we were not uh, uh, metals people. We didn't like the fact that amalgam had a lot of mercury in it. So we were doing a lot of work on that side, and it was quite good stuff. But because we weren't using metals, we were using um, the light curing fillings that they've got now. And this was back in the early days of it, before that they had uh, all the safety equipment so that your eyes were protected. And after about 20 years, I ended up with some serious eye damage in my retina. And uh, I managed with it as best I could, but after the five years or so of of dealing with that, it distorted everything, made made straight lines crooked and things, and that's not good when you're trying to, you know, do the kind of precise work that we were doing. So I ended up uh, leaving and selling my practice, and uh, now I'm one career down sort of thing, what, what do I do next? And uh, I tried consulting and a few things like that, and that was okay, I mean, it was it was all right. But I wanted something a little more stimulating, something different. So for my second act, I chose to go back to school for acting. And uh, I took courses with uh, Sears and Switzer in Toronto, which uh, they're, they're no longer doing that. They're coaches, but they're no longer doing. And uh, uh, the Pro Actors Studio and a number of places like that. There were half a dozen or more, I think, that I, I took back then. And then I started auditioning. And... Uh, I did a number of student films to start with, which are always exciting because they don't know anything more about what they're doing than we did. And uh, But, you know, it, it was fun, and uh, you got to meet people who now are serious directors and producers and, and some of them actors. And, uh, yeah, so so it just sort of evolved from that. And, and, you know, the sort of overnight sensation thing, I did about 10 years of almost nothing, and then lately I've been getting more roles and, uh, and uh, having a lot of fun with it. Not much money, but having a lot of fun with it. So, you know, that's the... That's my main objective right now. <laughs> so there is, in a five minutes or so, the, the complete story of my life. <laughs> is there anything that you've noticed that is similar between dentistry and acting? Well, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, um, you're a storyteller. Uh, you're talking to an audience that can't respond, which is kind of like yeah. looking into a camera. But... Uh, the uh, the other part of it is is learning to keep your cool because uh, things happen in in dentistry and um, people expect that you know what you're doing and uh, generally you do but occasionally you run across something new and the whole thing is don't let them see you sweat so you know um, oh I, that, that's supposed to break that way or this this you know I was expecting that or you know this is a normal amount of blood to see in this procedure and then you you deal with it and go on but um, yeah you have to sort of uh, hide the horror on your assistant's face from the patient when you're doing that. But uh, yeah, so that that part of it is, is good because uh, as you would know from the, being on sets, things are never going smoothly. There's always something in there, especially if you're doing stunts and things like that. Uh, so that was it. Um, the biggest benefit for me was meeting thousands of characters, people who had little peccadillos and things like that that you would say, hmm, that's that's interesting. I could use that someday. I didn't think that at the time, but I, do, I think that now. I think, aha, I'm going to use Elmer's story in this one, you know, for that, because these were the kind of people that I met. And so I, I apologize to anybody if they see themselves at some point in the film that I'm doing. I won't mention them by names, but, but it really is uh, a learning experience, meeting people, uh, seeing how they behave. I mean, Martin Short said that almost all the characters that he used on, on Second City and things like that were based on people he knew as a teenager. And he just modified them slightly to uh, to fit what he was after. And Because you can't make this stuff up. You're, you're far better off if you have a reference for it. And I think uh, um, I, because I didn't go to school, I like a lot of actors who didn't go to school but learned their craft watching other people doing things like that, like Michael Caine and Brian Cranston and so on, who had minimal acting training, but they're phenomenal observing people and and then creating a character based on that. Um, 
realistically, I've gotten more out of reading actors' biographies that I've used on set than I have out of just about anything that I was taught. Now, that's apologies to, you know, Sears and Switzer. That was excellent. And, uh, you know, a few others out there. I, I won't plug anybody on your show. That's not, not the purpose. But, but uh, no, it's, it's, it's uh, seeing people and, and, you know, saying, okay, that's how a person doing this sort of thing would react. Um, recently, I had the pleasure of doing an Air Canada safety video. And I went for the audition, and they were looking for people for the safety video. And they said, okay, we want you to be a Nova Scotia fisherman. And I said, okay, uh, you realize that there's maritime actor, you know, back in, in there. There's, there's got to be lots of Nova Scotian people who would look like fishermen, maybe even our fishermen who could take that role. I said, yeah, well, we're casting in Toronto. So anyway, I got that one. And, you know, when I traveled to Lunenburg to do this, I, you know, talk about, you know, being under the microscope. I stepped off out of the shuttle that took me there and there's like 10 guys who look like me on the dock you know and they're getting into fishing boats and going out and tossing traps for lobsters and I think oh god you know like they're going to notice anything I do that isn't right so fortunately I had a little bit of time and the guy who was running the boat I was on I said look quick give me the fast you know course in how you throw the traps how you retrieve them how you know everything you do and he was very good and helped me out. I did make one mistake, which I'll let people find out and point out for themselves. But, uh, yeah, so that ended it. So now if you're boarding an Air Canada flight that travels over water, you'll see me showing you how to put on your life jacket. But that's, you know, that's the sort of thing. You, you think, well, um, I talked to the actors who did the one for Air France, and they were passing as uh, flight attendants. And they were working with regular flight attendants. And Johan said really like how are we doing are we are we representing you correctly or you know or do we look like total fools and they said oh no no you're, you're doing a good job and uh so i mean that's the important thing your your job as an actor is to make it look like this is something you've done all your life and that you know what you're doing and you know this is this is who we are and you know not every actor is a physician or a dentist or a lawyer to play those kind of roles. I don't know. Have you ever played a physician on TV or Never. film? Never. I haven't either. I've 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 taken auditions for medical people. No, they didn't want me. So, yep. who knows? You know, you, you can't win for trying. Or they'll ask you to do something. You say, no, no, no. That's not the way it's done. And they go yeah. like, just do it. You know? <laughs> just, yeah. So, so it's a it's a weird profession. I, you know, I I should almost ask how you got into this thing because I mean I. Spent 25 years doing something else. <laughs> well, it is interesting, right? Like, I think I've had discussions with other people who had other jobs as well, too, who never go out for roles that they used to do. Cops, lawyers, teachers, doctors, yeah. right? And yeah. there's part of me that goes, like, if you want an actual physician, why not hire an actual physician to do the acting? Mm -hmm. But then the other part of me goes, I, you know, I guess if you really are a true trained actor, you can be anything and anyone. Well, that was what they told me on the Air Canada set. They said, you know, yes, there are these guys around, but they can't take direction the way you can. Interesting, I thought, yeah. okay, that's, mm -hmm. I guess, a fair cop. But, it, you know, it is interesting what you end up doing. And the trick is to make it look totally natural as though you've done this all your life. And, and uh mm -hmm. That's that's what I aspire to. Do I get it all the time? I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's a learning curve. There's nothing better than being on set and being in film to discover all the things that you don't do well. Uh, you you look at it afterwards and go, well, that could have gone differently. And so now I understand why a lot of well-known actors won't watch their own work because all you'll do is sit there and dissect it, a good medical term, uh, because you do. You look at it and go, well, that isn't quite how I thought it was going to turn out. But, you know, the, the public is not necessarily seeing that. So, you know, mm. we pulled it off. You know. And I think what has been an interesting thing for me, and let me know if you feel this, just given what your profession was as well, too, that kind of keeping cool under pressure. Mm. I know I definitely have a difficulty with showing emotion on my face that's not theater emotion. Emotion yes. for film and TV, 
but enough that it actually looks like the emotion and I'm not just like as a doctor you know we're taught like oh if there's something crazy going on don't show it like you were saying right yes everything is fine keep it cool but I think that I know has been a bit of a detriment to me because you know I feel the emotion of let's say sadness and it's not really showing on it's not reading on my face even though I'm feeling it because I'm kind of like hold it down Mm-hmm. smile on you're like no 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 this is acting now you're not doctoring yeah yeah i totally agree it's uh it's why i don't like the idea of doing horror because i think i would always be going like hmm that looks bad mm. this is scary mm-hmm. yeah. okay i i think what we're going to do is we're going to make a plan and we're going to run you know now and that's not what they're after they're they're looking for you know the muppets ah, you know, and then yes. then go yes. um yeah, th- those sorts of things are difficult, and and it's, I mean, there's a lot of. I think at this stage in my life, I have sort of avoided a lot of things that I know I won't do a convincing job at. I don't like playing an idiot on things. Um, maybe that's the idea of being competent and in charge. That doing a lot of commercials. I'm not convincing as an idiot, you know, and you have to be ready to make an absolute fool of yourself. And I just basically told my agent, I, I, I really don't want to do commercials. And I think that makes them sad because there's a lot of money in commercials for the agent. But, um, you know, I, I, you know, I found my little niche playing the sort of sympathetic and sage father or grandfather who gives lots of advice that nobody follows and uh uh you know just just that sort of guy who is is in that position i mean i I look at every role i've played in the last year and it's been uh, a father grandfather who you know people say oh yeah you know dr murray dr you know frank there you know and he's the he's the go-to guy but he is calm and cool under crisis and he's just you know that so i mean uh, now these are these are um, not high art movies, you know. I mean, we're not into the sort of cal- the caliber of uh, uh, the A-listers by any stretch. But um, you know, occasionally you are working with some fairly talented actors, and and uh, you know you you have to interact. And that's when you learn that you learn watching them because they have been doing it for long enough or often enough. I think that's my biggest problem. I get out of touch because I do, you know, like last year I did five films in the year and that's not enough to really keep you sharp, you know, whereas the, the leads and the one are Hallmark people and they're, they're going full time all the time. So when they step onto a set like this, it's just more of the same, you know, so. But I, I don't, I don't know. Like when, you know, when you really nailed it there, when you said doing that sort of, uh, uh, terrified, frightened thing. Yeah, when you're used to going like, no, this is normal, and you know, not a big deal. You you stifle it, and mm-hmm. that's a good call. I, I hadn't really thought about that, so um, that does explain <laughs> quite a bit. So. <laughs> Can I too, much, a bit too much, too much in control. Too much in control. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, you know what? If you found your niche, there's huge power in that, right? I think. Because we get, I, I get told either you need to find your niche and really hone into that, or you mm-hmm. need to, um, or the flip opposite, right? You can do whatever you want, but mm-hmm. which I don't think is true because I think the camera sees us in one way and the audience sees us in one way. Where I think we, I know myself personally, see myself in another way, and I need those need to kind of become more together. Can I catch my drift? Yeah, I, I think it. You know, what's what is handy is having experience in any of these things. So if I'm I'm being sympathetic to my film daughter or granddaughter or whatever, I can do that quite well because I've done that with three children of my own, and I I know that feeling. And uh, it's the trick is to have it sort of cross your face without being obvious. You know, and I think that's that's where having those things. Uh, to draw on are helpful because it's not the grand gestures or whatever it's the it's the minor things that people look at and say oh you know that is really his granddaughter because he has that sort of benign benevolent uh, kindly whatever you want to call it thing that 
that comes in. And so, you know, uh, if there's a hug or something like that, and I'm not a big huggy person, sorry, folks, that's not the way it works. I've been in places where they say, we all hug here. <laughs> not me. But, you know, when it's when it's something like that and you're said, OK, you're going to hug your granddaughter here. It's like, oh, yeah, I can do that. You know, that's that's a comfortable, normal thing. And it will be natural because that's that is comfortable. Um, it's doing those things that are uncomfortable, as you say, where you have to break out of your natural mold and say, I am going to be um, a terrified schoolgirl or uh, I don't get that role very often. But uh, something something where you have to exhibit a lot of emotion that you don't ordinarily do. Mm. And so that's that's where it's a stretch. And I think that will be my sort of constant crisis for all these things, you know, um, aside from one where they asked me to do some skateboarding and I said, I don't think so. You know, you better find somebody who skateboards or a good, good, uh, double who can do stunts, you know, yeah. that's, uh, I'm told that stunt doubles are very, very clever at things sometimes. I haven't had stunt doubles because grandfathers don't do crazy stuff very often, you know, <laughs> So there you go. Can, can I ask a bit more about your transition between like when you finished your dental practice and when you started acting again? Because, you know, that, mm -hmm. that must have been like tough when you had to sell your practice because of visual issues and stuff like that. What made you go back into acting? after something like that. Well, I thought you were bringing this up as a matter of trying to see if I could burst into tears here because honestly, selling my practice and getting exercise, out Jim. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I uh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm sliding off my chair here. Uh, yeah, it was um, honestly, if I had not uh, left dentistry, I'd still be doing it. Um, I loved what I was doing. I was doing uh, we had some amazing changes in people, people who were metal toxic, and then we got that stuff out, and they were seeing people going through detox. We had people who got out of wheelchairs and all this sort of stuff, which sounds apocryphal, but it was it was true. It just wasn't done under a controlled circumstance where a university was studying it. But um, we had so many people who were so much better uh, there, and, and I did about half my practice was orthodontics, so I used to look at my kids high school yearbooks and go that's mine that's mine that's mine <laughs> and is there something very satisfying in doing something that people want you know that they they liked the end result they were happy with it so it wasn't kind of like oh going to the dentist no I'm getting a great smile and you know that was that was a big part of it um, so when I left um, looking back on it I think that I wasn't in clinical depression but I was certainly depressed I, I, I thought you know this is this is not where I expected to be. And so it may have been a little bit of an escape, you know, going off and, and playing other parts and things like that uh, just to get out of my funk. Uh, because I, you know, I, I really, I mean, first of all, the money dried up and other things like that. So it was kind of a, um, if I was looking to make money, going into acting probably wasn't the best way to, to do that. Uh, so far, it's more of an expensive hobby than, <laughs> than uh, uh, an income source. But um, no, I I don't know. I said I, I think I struggled to stay in sort of the technical more than artistic side. And yet there was always a part of me that sort of said, you know, um, here's a chance to do something very different and see if you can do anything reasonably well at it. Because uh, acting is not something that, I mean, some people are absolute naturals. They they put a, point a camera at them and they just go ahead, and it's it's a beautiful thing to watch. But it's a lot of hard work for most people. Um, you know, I don't think anyone really sees the amount of uh, scene study, breaking it down, trying to figure out what your relationship is to somebody, how how uh, this person would react under that circumstance, all all those things, and. Uh, also, not being able to read the scripts very well because the printing is small and the eyes are bad and, uh, you know, stuff is copyrighted so you can't blow it up to huge sizes. So I, I struggle with that, particularly when they change the script on set. 
all of a sudden you're saying a whole bunch of different lines and I'm going like, I haven't memorized those yet. You might want to, uh, you know, uh, give me a minute <clears throat> or a day or two or a week. But anyway, um, yeah, there's challenges that way. So, um, yeah, but I, I think it was just the fact that it was something absolutely different. And that was what appealed to me. And uh, it also is kind of fun and discouraging and entertaining and, and a bit frightening to see yourself on film. Uh, something that other people look at and go, oh, you know, there's that. Of course, you know, my career in dentistry was over 25 years. So, you know, you get very accustomed to that. And then you get into a film thing and it's like, Jesus, <laughs> what the hell's going on here? But it's, it's so very fluid, you know, like things are changing all the time. And, you know, if you've been in the ER and things like that, you know that nothing is, is static. Things happen left, right, and center. And, but maybe when it's your first uh, act, shall we say, you're very comfortable with that because you know that happens in that sort of thing. When you go to something like a film set and you think, like, well, this will all be set in stone. Like, no, 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 no. Everything changes. What you think you were going to say, how you think you were going to say it, all the stuff that you did to prepare for it can be thrown out the window in a moment if they decide that that doesn't look good or it isn't warm enough. So why don't you try this line of dialogue instead? And you're going like, oh, I, okay, you know, like, with me, I have to spend so much time getting my dialogue down that when someone throws a, a change in me, I go like, oh, okay, you know, like delete and cut and insert and try to keep the brain working on that, that level. But it, it really is almost relaxing because once you get through the panic about that it's not going to be the way you thought it was going to be, then you just sort of get to the point where you more go with the flow. And I think what I found encouraging was that bigger name actors, like it's not hard to be a bigger name actor than me, but people who are well known goof up, they make mistakes, they forget lines, they they fall flat, you know. And so I think that was Clint Walker who started as a stunt man and he ended up being sort of the cowboy military guy of the fifties, really popular actor. He said, I went in as a stuntman figuring I couldn't do the lines or couldn't, you know, because I don't think I could remember it. And he says, all of a sudden I realized that the leads on these things were forgetting their lines. And I thought, well, I can do that too then. You know, like, and that was on film when you didn't want to do repeats, whereas on, on uh, digital, you know, they can just erase and go over it again. It's not a, not a costly thing like it is there. I mean, it is costly in terms of crew time and, and that sort of thing. But it's, I found the sets more fluid and more relaxing than I expected them to be. I thought it was going to be very technical, and uh, it ended up being pretty rough. Maybe that's just the ones I've been on. I mean, I've not been on, um, you know, a movie film set like something for theater release. I've done TV, made for TV movies, and and uh, uh, like serial TV type things and that. But uh, yeah, they all seem very relaxed, and and it just people go with it, and uh, big name actors make goofs, and they just laugh and turn around and do it again, and so. And they don't hold you responsible for making a mistake, which is a big thing. <laughs> you know, if you goof up, you're going like, oh, you know, all these people. Oh, we can go again. Uh, oh, all right. Okay. And then you just you go back and do it. And, you know, I'm, you know, I have trouble with memory work now. Not like when I was a kid, you know, it, it doesn't stick as easily. <laughs> so I like it when someone says, okay, we can do that again. Don't worry about it. So that was, that was good. Of, speaking of the sets you've been on, do you have mm -hmm. any favorite or memorable on set stories? Yes, actually it's, it's funny because the more I've done, the more comfortable I've become. Uh, but the last bigger one that I did was a Hallmark movie and the two leads were amazing. They were actually a boyfriend, girlfriend for a number of years. And so the chemistry between them was terrific. I played the grandfather to the female lead and so we had a few very sort of, like, when I mean intimate in terms of 
loving relationship back and forth, not uh, not hot and heavy stuff. No, that, uh, I don't get called to play the male romantic lead for things. I'm, I'm the, the, the teddy bear grandfather. So uh, we had a great little scene over a dining room table in this movie, and it just went on for well, three or four minutes, which is a fairly long scene in anything you're doing where it's kind of continuous. And it was just so nice because it was just like talking to my own daughter and we had that relationship for the entire movie and it was great and so it was very much being in the moment all along and you know she was excited about the fact that I had saved articles she'd written and you know framed them and that sort of thing and it was like just the the natural back and forth was so great that you forget that you're saying lines which is really what you want it to be, isn't it? The lines have to come come out as though this is the first time you've ever said them. And uh, even though you've said it 10 times or more, depending on how many takes they do. And, and you know, they do, they do a, a big dirty shot where you say it, and then they come in and they focus it on you and you say it for like five times. And then you're over, the sh over her shoulder looking at you doing this thing. And it's like, yeah, I'm getting really tired of these lines by the time they go, but they always have to come out in that same way. And it was so easy with her because she was just this natural, fresh-faced gal who could be my own could be my own daughter so that worked out really well and I play fathers and grandfathers a lot so that that was a, an interesting one when it was that smooth you know but she's she's a very good actress and uh, the the guy who plays her uh, fiance sort of thing same same deal so and the director was a sweetheart just you know totally comfortable with him so it was it was it was great and I, and you know after that I, I fell on my face and uh, banged myself up so I didn't audition for a while and uh, it's kind of nice to think back that that was the last one I did that was uh, you know my favorite and uh, so there you go it doesn't happen every day but most of the time you know people are if they know their stuff they're really easy to work with I've been with a couple of actors who well, there was one. Is it okay if I divert to the one that wasn't so uncomfortable? Uh, because I was, I was playing, I was playing this fellow's father, and uh, we had a set of lines, and it was a back and forth seesaw between he and I, and he hadn't memorized any of his lines. So all mine were predicated on particular things he would say, and he was rambling away, and you know, and, you know, and then I'm thinking like, okay, you know, we're going to get around to this so that I can say my line, and it, it didn't happen. And so, it, you know, after he talked for like five minutes and then didn't get a response from me, he said, like, what's going on? I said, well, you never mentioned what I have to respond to. <laughs> you know, this isn't a totally improvised scene. I went, oh, what do you mean? He says, oh, well, it's, it's this. He says, oh, okay. We did that scene probably 15 or 16 times before he got it right. And this is a better known guy. So, you know, those things happen. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, who knows, maybe he was up late the night before and didn't get to do it or whatever, but, you know, most people come prepared, and you know, if they're not, then that's a, that's a problem, so. You know, for the most part on, on sets, I mean, you know, I'm in a trailer, I get a little very small room in a trailer that has five, five sets of people in it, and then the other ones have got an Airstream that's got the whole thing, you know. Um, but when you're on set, I don't find, for the most part, there's any of that egotistical thing about, well, I'm the star and you're, you know, some peon who's brought in for the day. Uh, generally, you know, and, and of course, I also surprisingly don't find that I'm particularly awestruck by anybody I know well from doing things. If you're like in a scene with somebody who's, you admire or whatever, you know, they tend to come up and say, hi, you know, I'm... Yannick Besson, whatever, you know, this sort of thing. And you go, oh, okay, hi, I'm Jim. And uh, it just goes on. So it's, yeah, that, that feeling that you have to be perfect because they seem to be <laughs> is like, you know, I think it's far easier if you're playing a character in a role in a series or whatever. I mean, those guys know themselves inside out. They know their character inside out. So I think when you come on, they don't have a problem if you're struggling a bit with somebody who... Is totally new to the whole thing and I've gotten some good advice well you know he's, he's this sort of thing why not try it that way and you know sometimes an actor will direct most often the director directs you and says try it this way that might work better but um, yeah it's uh, 
I've, I haven't ever felt like a complete idiot. No, maybe once or twice. But, uh, you know, it's gen generally, you know, we, we go on and we try to be perfectionist. But uh, if you just go on and try to have a good time and make sure everybody else has a good time, then that works out too. If, if, if somebody tells you that the chances are one in a million, uh, you're probably going to say, oh, that sounds okay to me. Because that's how most actors go into it. They, they, they don't realize that there's, you know, 50, 60, 70 sometimes other people auditioning for the same role that you are. You know, we were told erroneously, uh, depending on where you go, if you go to a casting house sometimes, um, we were told that probably 10 to 12 people are in line for your role. And I remember once going for a commercial audition and I walked into the room and there were like 50 or 60 guys who looked kind of like me in one way or another. And I met a guy I've come to know quite well who uh, I was there and he said, uh, he says, you know, they don't know what they're looking for. They're hoping that you'll, you'll be it. And that's, that's it because you're doing them a favor when you come into the casting. They've been, they want to cast this thing and they want to find somebody who can do it. So when you go in, you give them your best shot and you know, you can't feel badly if you don't get it because, you know, you may be the wrong age, the wrong look, you know, the wrong height, whatever their perce perception is as to who this character is going to be, that would be it. So my my favorite quote on that part is, is actually a Michael Caine one, and I, and I have this, this uh, written down so that I keep reminding myself, but this is from his book, um, Blowing the Bloody Doors Off. And if you're an aspiring actor, um, I would get that book because Michael Caine, it's a great story, but it's also a great acting lesson because Michael Caine is very natural, very good at it. One of his comments is that you make sure you've got your lines down and everything else like that because the rehearsing is going to be the work and then the actual filming is going to be the relaxation. And it's kind of an interesting way to look at it because if you know your stuff, then you just get up there and you do it and that's fun and easy and the rest of it. But he said, and this is the end of one of the chapters, he said, there will always be someone faster than you, cleverer than you, better looking than you, <laughs> richer than you, or luckier than you. So forget competing with other people. It will just make you bitter, self-pitying, unhappy. Do your own thing and do it well as, you, as well as you possibly can. He says, when I was young, I read something urging Olympic athletes to chase the dream, not the competition. That line has stayed with me all my professional life. It's sound advice. And, you know, Michael Caine is very familiar with acting. You know, he started in the 1960s and is still going, <laughs> you know, so he's got over 60 years in the industry. And, uh, you know, and he's an older guy, even older than me. And so, you know, that part gives me some encouragement because, you know, if you're starting late, you think, well, why am I doing this? Because how many years would I have to do it? I'm about 10 years in now, and I'm expecting to be an overnight sa sensation in about another 10. So, you know, I'll be practically Michael Caine's age by then. So I have to, you know, just keep keep doing it, keep enjoying it, and not feel like I'm in competition with anybody. Because, uh, you know, I own my niche, which is kind of the guy on the Canadian Tire Money. And uh, that's that's who I am. I'm an old white guy, which is not a popular thing to be right now. You know, it's, I'm not terribly inclusive. God, Scots, Irish, 50-50, basically. So, uh, you know, I expect that in a lot of roles that I'm, I'm auditioning for, that someone who is of a different ethnicity or whatever will be more likely to get it because that's what they're looking for. But you go in and you do your thing. You do it as well as you can. You enjoy it, and then you forget about it until you get the call back. And then you can sit down and have a beer or whatever, you know, like that's, that's the thing. You know, you, you don't, don't, don't look at it as I have to have this job because if you have to have this job, you put so much pressure on yourself that you'll never enjoy it. And once I started relaxing, doing auditions and just doing it and then letting it go, it's like people started calling. <music>
<laughs> thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you dr jim for being my guest this week thank you so much for sharing your story i will probably see you soon like i said i am in the same improv group as his partner kk and we also were both in productions at the simcoe county theater festival together so you know he also lives about 10 minutes away from me so hopefully we will see each other soon <laughs> i hope you will all tune in next week for another episode of second act actors bye <laughs> <laughs>